The coronavirus outbreak impacting much more than just our health. We all are experiencing levels of stress and anxiety that perhaps we've never felt before. Out of work, how will families make ends meet? Think carefully about everything you spend. How do we handle fear, the anxiety, and how do we stay close to loved ones we can't see? This is a different kind of connection, I think, that that's really critical. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Ockerblum. And I'm Vanessa Welch. Every week, we're taking time to slow down the flood of the headlines and get answers to some of the questions all of us are asking. Now that all non-essential workers are being asked to stay home, we are looking at the impact on your money. How do we pay our bills without that paycheck? How do we save for the unknown that lies ahead? Ock, these are such critical questions right now. Earlier, I spoke with Babson Finance Professor Dr. Richard Bliss for some insight. Dr. Bliss, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, thanks. The halt to our economy that we are experiencing right now really is unprecedented. How do we move forward from this? Well, you're right, it is unprecedented. I think one of the biggest challenges is that the end is not yet in sight. So um, I think what's happened the last couple of days with uh, stimulus in terms of trying to backstop uh, economic activity, which has really come to a halt almost, um, is the right thing to do. Uh, and then I think it's a question of when the health concerns are of a level that we feel things are under control and then to begin to recover the economy. But this is something that we've never experienced before on such a scale. So it's going to be difficult. Let's talk about the stimulus package. What does this mean to the average person at home? Well, I mean, I saw it briefly today, and I think there will be checks that go out to folks. I think they did the right thing by, I think it's going to be capped at uh, 99,000 of income, um, and then it'll scale down from 75,000 to 99,000. So it should go to the folks that need it the most. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of research about how little savings many households have. And so I think those checks, um, and I think it's 1,200 per taxpayer and then 500 uh, for children, will be very necessary to help these people get through a period when many will experience not just uh, potential loss of income, but additional expenses. Let's talk about individuals. When they start to get that money, or families, when those checks start to roll in, what should people be doing with that money? $1,200 a person and 500 for children, this is not a huge amount of money. And so I think um, it's going to be the absolute emergency, immediate needs, food, shelter, and in some cases, medical care or, me or prescriptions. In your opinion, what will it take for local businesses to survive this? You know, small business owners and entrepreneurs are amongst the most resilient and innovative folks that, that are around. And so I think we're confident that even though there's a significant number of businesses that may struggle and some that will fail, uh, when things do recover and when the economy stabilizes and get back on track, okay, it's back on track, that you know, small business owners and entrepreneurs will be the first ones there to figure out how to get things um, moving again. And with every one of these disruptions, there's a lot of tragedy, there's a lot of heartbreak, but there's also opportunities. Financially, what should we all be doing right now? The worst time to uh, rethink your portfolio is after a, a cataclysmic fall like this. There's a lot of evidence that people can't time markets. So I think in terms of investments, I would sit tight. Um, and then I would look at everybody, I would urge everyone to look at their budget and say, are there ways that I can cut things? You know, we have a lot of money that people spend on monthly subscriptions. Maybe you don't need all those right now. I think focusing on the key things, which is, you know, rent or a mortgage payment, uh, certainly food and uh, medical supplies or prescriptions. That's where we want to kind of rethink our budget and make sure that we can can cover that in the near term. Um, but we do know that credit card debt is problematic for certain folks. So I would urge people to be careful there. Dr. Bliss, great advice so far. Any final thoughts, anything else you want to let our viewers know as it relates to finance and where we are right now uh, with the economy and what we're experiencing with the coronavirus? Do your homework and figure out what you can get, what you deserve and what you need, and then go out and advocate for it. Wise advice. Dr. Richard Bliss, Babson Finance Professor, thank you so much for your time and your insight. My pleasure. Thanks. 25 investigates digging deeper into the historic unemployment numbers coming out now. We're hearing from many of you that the state's program to apply for help is overwhelmed. Investigative reporter Ted Daniel takes a closer look at the problem. Layoffs associated with this global health emergency have been adding up for about a month and they exploded last week. There are tens of thousands of people in Massachusetts who need unemployment for necessities like food and rent. 
The state's infrastructure for handling the claims, it's being tested like never before. At the Dorchester home Isaiah Hunt shares with his fiance and young daughter, the fridge and pantry are stocked. Isaiah had to dip into his savings to buy food and money is running out. Once the savings go down to zero, I feel like there's no hope or anything. Isaiah drives a school van for a private transportation company. He says he was laid off two weeks ago. His services are no longer needed. Unemployment claims have gone up more than 1900% with nearly 150,000 filings in one week, a record number. Due to high volume as a result of COVID-19, the fastest way to apply for unemployment assistance is through UI Online. If you need to speak with a representative, please complete the contact request form on the department's website. That message is from the State Department of Unemployment Assistance Hotline. Isaiah has tried numerous times to file online, but he says the system won't let him create an account. Online, they said try to go online and get a call back from them, but the call back was full. So it says try again another day. I go back the next day, I try filling out for the call back. Still haven't received the call back since that day. I've tried. How long ago was that? How long ago was that? Like two weeks now. The State Department of Unemployment Assistance tells 25 Investigates it's doing everything it can to process claims as quickly as possible in these unprecedented times. The call center 10 days ago, 15 days ago, had roughly 50 people in it. Now the call center has 300 people in it, and they're all working remotely, and by this time next week, it'll probably have over 400 people in it. My mom, my other family members, they all depend on me, and. It's just very stressful. Restaurant and hotel employees filed the most claims in Massachusetts last week. More than 44,000 were filed. Nobody's going to get rich from unemployment. Weekly benefits are about half of weekly earnings, and the maximum anyone can receive for a week is $823. For 25 Investigates, I'm Ted Daniel. The skyrocketing unemployment numbers are startling, but there are some companies out there that are hiring as they respond to consumer demand with everyone stuck at home right now. Whole Foods announcing they're hiring 5,000 more workers at an increased hourly rate, including many right here in our area. Instacart plans to hire 300,000 workers during the next three months. It will more than double the company's current workforce. Amazon and Walmart have both announced plans to hire at least 100,000 workers. Restaurant chains, including Domino's, and Papa John's are hoping to hire several thousand workers. Dollar General has plans to hire 50,000 people. And Walgreens is looking to add almost 10,000 new jobs in its stores across the U.S. The job market is difficult for veterans to navigate along with everyone else. And just ahead, how virtual job fairs are now helping these heroes find employers. It's just permeating everything that we think about right now. And, and I, because we can't, again, see the coronavirus in particular, we kind of sense that thread everywhere. Tackling fear and anxiety. Mental health is a top concern for many right now. We're talking about helpful ways to cope when we come back. Welcome back. Jobs are a huge concern for so many right now, and that includes our veterans. As Boston 25 News anchor Chris Flanagan shows us, traditional job fairs are now going virtual to connect veterans with work when they really need it. Gillette Stadium was supposed to be hosting dozens of employers and hundreds of veterans. Instead, Recruit Military's job fair is now virtual. The uncertain times, it comes down to keeping a calm head and operating safely. Event director Justin Henderson says the skills veterans develop through their service, the ability to adapt and work remotely as a team make them well suited to our current job market. Going to jump right into the March 17th National Virtual Career Fair. And his organization is helping vets make that connection. Know your value and then hyper focus where you can make a good impact in organizations. Henderson says despite all the business closings, certain sectors of the economy are scrambling to hire. We have everything from public services, you know, mass transportation, the, the T downtown, to hospitals are coming in and looking for talent, everything from nurses, doctors, which are critically important, but people forget about those people supporting them, the facilities maintenance, the maintenance people, they're gonna keep that hospital running while the doctors and nurses are keeping everybody uh, safe. But we're all having several companies come to us saying, we need help, you know, the Instacarts, the 
Walmarts, the Kroger's, the Shaw's, all those companies are saying, hey, we're actually here fighting to get our country through this and we need help. And they're coming to our veterans. And he says that sparks hope for the job market in the future. I think we have this stop, pause and wait for the safety of our community. We're doing the social distancing. And then once this comes out, there's going to be pent up demand. Veterans, National Guard members, reservists and military spouses can access a list of virtual events, digital services and other career resources. Visit our website, boston25news.com, and we'll link you over. I'm Chris Flanagan, Boston 25 News. From money to health concerns to the isolation of being home for weeks, fear and anxiety are very real for many of us. And we spoke with psychology experts for ways we could try to calm those fears and cope. Cases of deaths on the... But now we're seeing constant threats of coronavirus everywhere and the, the difficulties in the hospitals, and it's causing 24-7 stress to people. Northeastern psychology professor Dr. David DeSteno says that stress and the fear that comes with it is already taking a toll. Sometimes that fear can spiral out of control and cause us to engage in some problematic behaviors too. One of the big problems with COVID-19 is that it is an unseen threat. I can't see where the virus you know, is in the air or on a surface. And when we can't really see the threat and know where it is accurately in the way you could with an earthquake or a flood or something like that, um, the fear we feel has more opportunity to fill in the blanks and it makes everything seem more threatening. So if I sneeze and I'm feeling afraid or anxious, I'm much more likely to believe that that sneeze might mean I have coronavirus than it's my seasonal allergies. While we can't control what's happening, Dr. DeSteno says we can control how we react. The first step, maybe taking a break from social media from time to time. So please be informed, but also take time with your family, your own self, engage in meditation or contemplation. That works really well. Uh, it's a time to think about things in your life that you are grateful for. Watch some movies. Try and curate your own emotional experiences to reduce that stress because the stress itself is going to harm your health. Try to find ways to connect with others from a distance. Normally when any type of disaster hits, um, the way that humans tend to show resilience is that we all come together. The problem with COVID-19 is the ways that we normally try to give comfort to each other, we can't. It's scrambling it. We have to stay socially isolated. And loneliness, chronic loneliness is about as bad for your health in terms of morbidity as is smoking. He recommends creating a virtual way to help others. People begin to pay it forward. And if you feel that you're engaged in some activity that has a purpose that can help someone that makes you feel empowered it gives you a sense of control that will reduce your stress and also increase your senses of connection to other people and the way we're going to solve this is if we all work together and we're all willing to sacrifice to social distance or to do those uncomfortable things that in the short term are hard but in the long term i think will will bond us to each other and and lead to a better outcome dr desteno says even if you've never done it before now might be a good time to give meditation a try to calm your fear and help quiet anxiety. Such great advice. Connecting through computers in a way we never thought possible just a few weeks ago. That's one of the areas of teaching where I think um, you know technology works and, and it fits very well. From school and working remotely to Zoom happy hours, how technology is helping us stay connected while in isolation. And later, writing your way to peace in these hectic times. The role of journaling is playing for many people stuck at home and for historians. Whether it's working remotely, homeschooling, or socializing, we've all become technology experts pretty quickly to adjust to our new way of life right now. I spoke with Boston College Management and Technology Professor John Gallagher earlier about how we're adapting and how it's keeping us connected in an otherwise isolating time. Let's start with how far we've come. You know, years sure. ago, the level of connection that we have on Zoom and on FaceTime, our ability to work remotely and still stay connected to our colleagues just wasn't even possible. Absolutely. If had this happened 10 years ago before everybody had broadband in their home or a device in their pocket that was capable of video conferencing, 
uh, this would have been a, a much more challenging crisis for us to work through. Talk to us about some of the ways that technology is making this time easier for all of us. I haven't lost connection with my students. And in fact, in some ways, the interactions that we've had are, have been richer. And now when I talk them through a Zoom experience, I'm uh, having them go ahead and, and sort of click in certain spaces or correct their errors. That's one of the areas of teaching where I think you know, technology works and, and it fits very well. It's, it's been great to connect with my students and see you know, they're getting settled where they are and they seem to continue to learn. Do you think that the comfort level that the younger generations have with technology makes this time a lot easier for them. I mean, is this a lot more challenging for our older generation? No question. The, um, the young students have really embraced this. The transition into Zoom, though, has been pretty easy. It's interesting that we have settled on Zoom, and Zoom has sort of exploded. I wish I owned some Zoom stock before know, this. Right? It's been incredible how they've done. Before this, I think most folks would have relied on Google Hangouts or um, Skype or on FaceTime. It's interesting to see, you know, as far as girlfriends go, uh, we're having the cocktail hour via Zoom or maybe all eating together in our own homes via Zoom. So what are your thoughts on that? Is it important for us to use the technology to stay connected in that way to have some sense of normalcy? Oh, I, I think it's very important. But to the extent that it can help us have those kinds of connections, I think that that's really critical, especially now, you and I have families at home, and, and it's easy for us to feel part of at least that unit. But gee, for singles that are social isola socially isolating, or the students that are stuck in their dorm, or you know maybe the group of students that are still living off of campus, that's tough for them. So I'd say, yeah, definitely watch a Netflix show together if you can, or um, you know have karaoke night on on Zoom. Right. Um, there's lots of fun things you can do, and maybe your karaoke inhibitions will, will be um, fall down a little bit more easier when, when you're not in the same room as someone. Love it. Great advice, great insight. We appreciate your time and appreciate no you sharing your home with us. That's a new way. How about finding an old school way to process a new world of stress? So for me, it's kind of a gateway. Um, I'm not an artist. I'm not a writer per se. I just do this, you know, on my own time. How writing in a journal is helping many people make sense of their chaotic lives right now. Welcome back. As the days of self-quarantine stretch into weeks now, we're all finding ways that help us cope. And for many, journaling has been a great way to process what's going on, providing perspective day to day and for history. It's a moment in time where I'm actually able to be quiet with my thoughts. Medfield mother and nurse practitioner Sarah Kaiser says now more than ever, journaling is providing a sense of peace. Now that I'm quarantined at home with three little kids, busy little kids, seven, five, and one, and I don't have time to sit and just think. And so at the end of the night, when I put them to bed, it's been an amazing way to process everything that's going on, just getting everything that's swirling in my head down written on paper. Northeastern professor Victoria Kane tells me historically, journaling has a positive impact. A lot of people I think are finding this therapeutic to be able to actually pen their thoughts the old fashioned way. That's right. I mean, it provides us, I think, with a sense of connection across time and space. Um, and that's important for scholars who are seeking to understand what happened, but it's also really important as people want a sense of connection. A connection through what we are all experiencing every day. What we don't know as much about is the people in the past who are extraordinarily ordinary. Diaries help us understand the experiences of just everyday folks, and so they're really valuable. And so I'm hopeful that looking back, that's what's going to stand out most, my time with my kids, the intimate moments with um, them that I normally don't get to have when I'm working full time. Sarah says you don't need to think about writing a novel. Sometimes she just starts with a picture. Often on days where I'm super busy, I will just do bullet lists. I'll do a bullet list of gratitudes or I'll do a bullet list of things that stood out for me or things that brought me joy in my day. It's important to know, pardon the pun, you, you want to do this on paper. I mean, paper lasts, paper persists. A diary can be pan that's on paper can be passed from hand to hand. It can wind up in a library and survive for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, that's not true of a tweet 
or a Facebook post. It's a really beautiful thing to open a real book with real pages and soft paper and pick up a pen that you really enjoy writing with and um, just experience the process of writing. Most of us aren't doing that in our careers anymore and certainly day to day. We're all on the computer, we're all typing away. So I think we all need a way to process. And we're all gonna have to figure out what that is, whether it be exercise for some or long walks or you know, for others it's writing, but you won't know what works for you till you try. Professor Kane tells me there's no right or wrong way to journal, whether it's writing a lot or a little, just do what's most helpful for you. Vanessa? And, Ak, we hope the last 30 minutes have been helpful for all of our viewers. And remember, we have a ton of resources on the coronavirus outbreak on our website, also our app, and on social media. Thanks for joining us for this in-depth special, finding ways to help us all cope with financial concerns and the isolation of life since the coronavirus outbreak. From all of us here at Boston 25 News, be well and have a great evening.